Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. I love dark fantasy. The violence, the brooding, the edge. Oh, I just eat that stuff up. Before I got converted by all of you degenerates into watching anime, reading manga, and consuming other media from the East, there was one series of Japanese video games that I adored above all others. And that series was good old Dark Souls. Between all the playthroughs of Dark Souls 1 and 3 I have under my belt, I must have kicked Gwyn in the crotch at least 17 times at this point. And don't even get me started on Bloodborne. But I kept hearing about this series that a lot of the themes of the games were taken from, called Berserk, which starred this brick shit house of a man carrying a lump of iron too big to be called a sword. I don't know, I think his name is Nuts or something. I'm just kidding, I fell in love with Guts in the world of Berserk the second I laid eyes on it. Berserk has got to be the gold standard for character writing. So you'd think that I'd love to play a game of D&D that adopts a lot of the same themes that Berserk does, right? Absolutely f***ing not. I love Berserk, but that does not mean I want to live through the events of the Eclipse. The story I have for you today stars a player whose GM took the tragic hero trope a little too far and forgot that a story of a tragic hero is fun for everyone except the hero. Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes from Reddit user Mr. Tricorder and is titled, I'm Not Going to Fight Windmills. I don't know what to make of this, so let's get internet strangers in on this. I've been playing a Curse of Strahd game with a paid GM for almost a year, and it's been absolutely wonderful. So of course, a follow-up homebrew campaign was offered, one with gruesome horror and maximum player agency. Our characters are dead, and they are now stuck in some form of hell. Why not? Or so I thought. We've been talking about themes, characters, and whatnot to prepare for the horror. Near the end of the session zero, the GM dropped the info that we are going to be using individual XP rather than milestones. Players voiced their concerns and the GM mostly shut them down. To explain all of this would be a spoiler. It's gonna be part of how this world works. So the players accepted that and moved on. Early on, I ran into some bandit types and suddenly some XP dropped. In this world, you only gain XP by killing people and sort of, uh, sucking up their souls. I voiced concerns that this will incentivize murder hoboing, and she confirmed that this is indeed the design choice she made. She wants to incentivize murder hoboing and make the characters struggle against the temptation to murder people for power. I wasn't really satisfied with that. I mean, every player actually stated that we want to stay the hell away from murder hoboing no matter what. She reiterated that the goal is to not to teach murder hoboing to the players, but to highlight the morality of the situation and to make the characters find other ways to succeed other than just killing. I didn't know what to say to this, so I just went along. We pushed further, but since we refused to kill people and eat their souls, the game became a drag. Six sessions of level one slow crawling without any noticeable progress, and I had had enough of that. So I talked to the GM again, asking if this is even a viable playstyle for this campaign, or if we need to be rethinking our approach. I was told that there will be other rewards to look forward to, and if I continue down this path, I might miss out on a good chunk of XP but I might gain other advantages such as followers or faction standing to make up for the XP gap. To be honest, this already took a big chunk of enthusiasm out of the game. The crap sack world we played in was so full of crap sackiness, I didn't look forward to gain standing with any of them. And the NPCs were just shitty in general, and I didn't really want any of them to be my followers. Oh boy, you can already see all the cracks starting to form here. I discussed the concept of paid GMs in the past, and overall I still think the concept is kinda silly. It turns GMing into a product, 
perfect. And very rarely is your GM's style gonna be perfect for everyone, and the presence of a financial transaction kinda establishes that expectation. Like, if I commission an artist to make art of a D&D &D character, I'm always gonna be in direct communication with them so I can get the best possible product from them. You can't really do that with a paid GM because it's just not your product. It's a bunch of other people's product, too. In a private group, the GM's only payment is having fun, so there's not a lot of expectations. But if you're paying someone, there's gonna be that expectation that you're gonna be getting your money's worth, which is gonna be different for different people. Look, I want to make it very clear that I'm not disparaging the concept entirely, but for me, I think I'd rather not play D&D at all than pay a stranger to play with me. That being said, if a GM is starting off a game by actively vetoing the concerns of every single player at the table in one fell swoop, especially if they're a paid GM, yikes. It's like if a plumber comes into your house, rips out your sink, only for them to ignore you when you tell them that it's actually the shower that's broken. It's gonna be a rough start to a job that you're straight up not gonna be satisfied with. The NPCs on display were a selection of... Oppressive Megachurch, Mercenaries Are Us, The Fantasy CIA, The Fantasy Borg Collective, and Mr. I'm gonna steal your XP when you support me. If there's more, I don't remember. Information we gathered was always biased, unreliable, and sometimes outright a lie. I realize that there might be a lot of confusion. Out of game, the GM pointed us to a quest that would grant us some XP. Driven by hope, I gave it another chance, so we accepted another quest. Some mercenary work for the mega church guys. We were compromising on our anti-murder stance and decided that this time we're going to kill a bunch of strangers for money. And quite frankly, since everyone was terrible and the faction we were about to fight against sounded bad enough, eh, I felt confident that we'd be up against some baddies anyway. That just might make it okay-ish. But when we arrived, the GM revealed that these people are my PC's old drinking buddies. FML. On site was some MacGuffin that gave us a bit of XP anyway at least, so there was some hope. Half the group was level 3, some level 2 now. Progress! We decided to try to convince my buddies to our cause, but the chances were slim. We were prepared to break contract and join their faction instead. But in order to do that, we would need some protection, since the church will probably kill us the moment we show up anywhere. My old drinking buddy NPCs got understandably angry. But when I told them, hey man, times are tough, we struggle and we try to make the best of it, we don't like the church anyway, how about a double cross with the help of your employer? The NPC just went on a rant calling me an immoral traitor and a murderer for even entertaining the idea. He clarified next time that we meet, we would be enemies anyway. Confused and unable to cope, I keep quiet. This left an aftertaste of a rug pool in my mouth. Either I murder my friends, or I become a target for a hyper-influential organization that might as well kill us on sight next time we show up. That's what you get when you want to level up, I guess. Greedy me. Another player threatened the NPC with the full might of our employer, and that worked. So they went away. But of course, they told their commander, and the next day she rides to us on a dragon. You now spy on your employer for me for a whole month or else my dragon is going to eat you. I played a fighter, a simple soldier turned adventurer. I do not have any skills nor the energy for a prolonged spy quest that I don't even want to do. This quest was surely set up to fail. I contemplated on just coming clean to the church anyway, but it never came to that, since right after, that's when my last quest happened. Some NPC slides us the information that there is a missing girl in the city. We went into a slum, and no one is caring enough to go look for her. Hell yeah, let's go. Although we get a warning that in the slums, people are friendly, and there's no need for weapons and armor. Even more so, it might scare the people and make the task of asking around impossible. So I doffed my armor and left my weapons at home. Well, it turns out that this quest was a trap by the Fantasy Borg Collective. They lure in people to assimilate them this way. The session ended with a comment by the GM. 
that this encounter has DPK'd some groups on other tables that she runs. Some wrap-up talk happens, and she elaborates that yes, this was all a ruse and we fell into the trap. I talked a bit with the GM after that, and the general tone was, but look at how much good RP we are creating. And a hyperbolic, you don't play D&D to win. She seemed to enjoy how tragic everything around my character was, and that a tragedy where the hero ultimately fails and achieves nothing is an interesting story to follow. But I think a game without the chance of success is meaningless, no matter how good the RP is. No matter what we do, we're being set up for failure anyway. I'm not gonna fight windmills. That's the role I was assigned, but not the role I wanted. Well, anyway, that was it. And so I left the table. TLDR, GM gives me the role of Don Quixote and sets me up to fail. End of story. So I get what the GM was going for here. It was a dark atmosphere with dark themes that highlights mankind's pointless struggle against inevitability, yada, yada, yada. Bro, I experience that shit every day just by getting out of bed every morning. At the beginning of the video I referenced Berserk, and one of the main reasons that I love that series is the main theme, about fighting against your destined path no matter how inevitable your fate may be, and finding happiness and meaning in the little things and in the relationships that we make with other people. Also because it's badass watching this linebacker of a man cleave through demons with the coolest f***ing sword ever to come out of Japan, anyways, off topic. In the grand scheme of struggling against existence, D&D is one of those things that people find joy in. Taking away all meaning from it? Yeah, that kinda sucks. If I'm pretending to be a gnome that can shoot freaking laser beams and feeds his friends magical jelly beans, I'm probably there trying to have a good time. Granted, dark games like this can be super fun when it's something that all the players agree on. But just dropping the whole surprise, nothing you or any of your characters matters, go f yourself thing in your player's lap after like six sessions isn't going to make your players ponder what it means to be human. It's going to make them ponder how poorly they've spent their money. And on that note, how about we go ahead and take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from viewer Oni Hybart and depicts a prompt from our Discord exclusive art contest. The prompt was Game Night with the Narrators, and she interpreted that as time to beat up Drake. In case you guys weren't present for Hybart's last fan art submission, this is the same person who made Femboy Drake, which has become canon against my will. Honestly, any submission by Hybart is a treat, and I'm happy to show off their contest submission. That's bullshit! I was lagging! Uno! Again with the frickin' draw four. I'll make you draw four, you little red riding hood looking ass. Murkrow used bitch slap. <laughs> oh, sorry, buddy. I, I was planting some trees. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Back to DD! &D. Thank you again, Oni Hybart, for submitting your art. If you'd like to see your fan art featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section, along with anything you'd like me to promote in my description. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can inspire artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, my Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.